Okay, thanks everybody for joining us today for our next installation of the bioengineering seminar series. Today we have Scott Lee with us from currently in Kansas City, um, <clears throat> Chief Revenue Officer of a company called Ronoc, and he's here today to talk to us about his, their <clears throat> bio block system for generating biomimetic microenvironments. And with that, I'm going to leave it over to Scott for the remainder of the session. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot, Nick. Um, uh, kind of my goals for today are going to be, I want to explain, you know, what we do at Ronak, how we came to be, our 3D printing and what we do. But more importantly than that is my goal is for you. Um, I hope we open a dialogue. I hope we light you on fire. And I hope we build on, you can think about how you build on what we do. Um, I always think that collaboration is a phenomenal model to build bridges as well as it is to build science. So having said that, everybody that's on this call, what I'm going to suggest you do, the first thing you do after this call, find me on LinkedIn. My name is Scott, last name is spelled L-E-I-G-H. Find me under Ronak and connect with me. If you ever have career questions, questions about Ronak, I am very open to talk with folks like you um, because we never know where these things are going to lead. So that is an open invitation. So let's get started. What is Rona? We are a bio product manufacturing. Another way to say that is we're a bio tools company. And why does that matter to you? And I like to use the Reese's peanut butter cups as an example. What's really important, whoops, Got to hold that cursor over there. So if we think about Reese's, everybody knows this. This is the number one candy in the United States today, but it's actually almost a hundred year old company. It took 50 plus years between, before Reese's had a second product, the Reese's Pieces. It wasn't until 2012 that it became the number one candy, and now it's 62% larger than any other candy. So as I go through this presentation, I want you to think of that we're the chocolate and you're the peanut butter, and it's never going to be one thing. When we talk about engineering just on Reese's, somebody had to figure out how to put the chocolate with the peanut butter. They had to figure out the different uh, coatings that need to go into that. They had to figure out the wrappers. And then once they move to Reese's Pieces, that coating has to be developed. Um, and it just keeps going and going. So that's why one of the reasons you're in the best seat you possibly could be in today is because what happens today and what gets built on it, it's never one thing. What we see today will radically change in five years, 10 years, 20 years. Um, so let's build that together. So what is Roanoke? This gentleman you see up here in the hood, that's Dr. A.J. Malat. He is the inventor of the BioBlocks. He uh, was a grad student at University of Kansas when I first met him, and he had to culture well over a billion cells in his grad program in biomedical engineering, University of Kansas. He actually ended up uh, thinking there's got to be a different way because culturing in TFLAS billions of cells, you can imagine, it just takes too long. They also had a 3D printer in the lab. He was also friends with the woman you see here, Heather Decker. Heather Decker uh, was working in the microscopy core at University of Kansas. She had some unique skills in microscopy. She had some unique skills in programming and her father was an engineer. So they started talking and ultimately what they built was this little hydrogel C in the bottom corner. In 2019, they launched the company and uh, in 2021, we started talking. I went to their open house in 2019, and I will admit to this day, I did not get it in 2019. I saw another hydrogel and I was wrong. We went to lunch right before the pandemic started. I still didn't get it. It wasn't until the third meeting when they said, you know, we can scale this without a subculture. And I said, well, that's enough. That's a huge advancement. The other people you see in this picture on the top, that's where we started expanding. Like I said, it's never one person, it's more than one person. And sometimes you have to bring these business people in of how do we talk about something so complex 
but we make it simple for people. So what did we what did we create? We created this hydrogel. What you see is a one centimeter cube that's shaped like a puzzle piece. We 3D print this. AJ had an idea. AJ and Heather developed a design. They found a printer. They discovered the printer could not print what they wanted to. So they talked to the, the manufacturer and they got access to break into the software. They rewrote the software. So not only did we have an idea, we had a build. We now have our own software. We then had to create our own ink. There's over 400 trade secrets to make this product today, but each one of those built on something else, something else, something else. So you could, and now we have an incredibly unique printer. So we have not only an idea, we have a build, we have software, we have an ink, and we have a printer. Any one of those things, and you, you can't reproduce what we've created. So how does this work? You can take any cell line, all these little dots you see on the block, these are pores that lead to channels that wind through the block, and I'm gonna get into that, how this all works. We're gonna start from a 10,000 foot value statement, and we're gonna get down in the minutia of how cells are replicating into what appears to be tissue in the block. So how does it work? This is our value statement. We can start in one block compared to 2D. We're able to scale uh, in that one block indefinitely. We can go to valuation staying in the same substrate. We reduce the, 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 the cost of production. We recruit, reduce the materials. We can take this now into development. If we want to move into a clinical trial and scaling, we can do that. Imagine staying in the same substrate from idea in discovery all the way through scaling. Currently, what you see on the bottom of this slide is what's happening in industry. You start with one flash, you move to two, you move to four, you have to create all this stuff in a monolayer to move to the next thing. Eventually, when you're in scaling, you're moving to hollow fiber or bioreactors. You would stay in the same substrate in Definitely. Now, next slide in this is how do we compare to other models? There's nothing wrong with these models. They've gotten us so far, but what we're able to do is imagine a substrate that you grow your, you take any cell line, primary or mortalized, you seed it in this block, you get three dimensional growth that's mimicking tissue but it's also improving the quality of the cell and the byproduct, and you can scale in it now. That's different than other, all other spheroids and hydrogels on the market. With that, how do we compare more on a continuum? Again, there's nothing wrong with 2D. It's a great way, it's an easy way to scale. It's relatively low cost, but it's not natural. Nothing in our body grows in 2D. Organoid and spheroids, we've been doing this since the 80s. They're great. They give us 3D modeling. The challenge is how do we scale them? People are trying to figure that out, not getting very successful. The other thing is they tend to form necrotic cores. They'll live 7, 14. If you get them to 30 days, great. We're able to grow continuously and indefinitely, and I'll get into that a little bit more on how that works. We're able to scale, stay in the same substrate, easy to use, and it appears to be mimicking tissue. Here's the one challenge, and this is why you are terribly important to have this conversation. The challenge we have is all the assays and data that's needed hasn't been created. And I'm gonna circle back at the very end of that to bring this full circle. But think, that is a very important. You can make a career just coming up on the next assay that matters. Are we animals? No but we're somewhere between current 3D models and animals because of these things. We're able to expand. We are able to expand, expand continuously. So let's talk about how it works. If you want to grow cells in our block and you can pipette, you can work with our block. That's the only skill necessary to grow cells. So up in that top right corner where you see four blocks, uh, connected together in one well of a six well plate, you could seed all four or you could seed one block and you just pipette your cells into the block. The, the 
weight of the media and the cells will start to travel through the channels and the cells start adhering to the inside of those channels and forming the structures they want. To expand, you would just add a second, third block. Once you start to see growth in all four blocks, which will happen within days because the cells will migrate freely, you can separate these into a six well plate and add more empty blocks and they will continue to proliferate. I've mentioned that we've grown adipose stem cells for six months by just adding and subtracting blocks. At each stage on that previous, if we want to pull one off to do histology, we can do that. We want to pull one off to do genomics. Another way to think about this is like a sourdough starter. You start with the sourdough, you peel some off, you make a loaf. That will continue to grow indefinitely. This is an important point for cell culture. As long as you add blocks and subtract blocks, you will never reach confluency in our blocks. It's very important. So the way that works is once we add a second block or a third block, the cells pick up the mechanical signal and they start migrating from hydrogel one to hydrogel two. What you see in these other images like pore channel is this is how the cells are creating structure and winding their way through. This is a very interesting uh, panel down here that says pore channel. Two years ago, we sent our blocks to Nikon. We were interested in one of their confocal scopes. They reported back that they are seeing things, structures form they've never seen before, and they would like to pursue talking to us. They came out at the uh, end of summer last year when we were able to purchase a scope. We had to raise the funds. Um, and they said, we would like to enter into a co-marketing agreement with you. We think you have the highest fidelity, most consistent hydrogel on the market. And again, we're seeing things in your block we have never seen before. We'd like to pursue that. They will be out next week for furthering those discussions. But we felt like that was pretty good validation of what we're doing. Uh, my guess is Nikon sees a lot more than we will see on any given day. So. Continuing on this, just to kind of bring it a little bit further, these micro channels or micro pores are a highway for the cells to communicate, to, to uh, migrate, and to proliferate. Those micro channels designs allow the cells to migrate between attached gels. This module eliminates the need for subculture, so we're never putting our cells through trypsin. And that data is going to become very important in a few slides when you see the quality of our product or the byproduct, the cells, the biologics. And so what you see is the cells actually are forming the structures they want to form. And this is gonna be really cool as they start to show you the structures. Um, IPSCs are forming different structures than HEC 293. HEC 293 is forming different structures than mesenchymal stem cells. And, the, you know, and so the cells are doing what they want in our product. Also, I'm going to point this out. These cells never grow into our material. They grow through the channels, through the pores, and connect. They can manipulate the material, but that material never interferes with the cell signaling, the nutrient exchange, the exosome exchange, or the proliferation of those cells. So what does the data tell us? First, uh, or one of the things we wanted to know was, are we getting good heat and gas distribution throughout the product? And we had this company O2 map this. I will tell you, I just, I can't get this data fast enough into this presentation, but I met with a company this week that is looking at the macro cell culture environment and they have data that mirrors our micro environment is how important is temperature and gas and media exchange. I think we know this, through tire on the air, but it really makes a significant difference in how those cells are going to replicate over time. Our block provides that microenvironment for this. One of the things we want to check is phenotype in our blocks. So we check these are three markers that we've used and we've published with, but most certainly um, this is true on lots of markers that we've done. These are in adipose stem cells. What we see in every cell that we've worked with, every client we've worked with, is the cells retain their phenotypes longer than 2D. 
And again, I mentioned that we don't go through a subculture. You can imagine if you were adding a toxin to your body every couple days, eventually you're just not going to be the same as what you were once were. We eliminate that step so the cells stay in that native state significantly longer, allowing them uh, to be a far better product for whatever study we're working on at that time. This was really interesting. Dr. Hodge uh, published on this too. In the fall of 21, he was wondering about senescence. He suspected that he had lower senescence in the bioblock than he did in other methods. So he took senescent cells, he reseeded them in the block, and he saw a 72% reduction in those senescent cells. So then he went about and started studying that senescence. This is another, th we're actually repeating this study right now in our own company. We see significantly lower senescence over time. When we compare this, and this is, I mentioned we don't have passages, so when you're looking at this, uh, and I apologize if anybody's colorblind, I understand that it's sometimes difficult. On the left, in the darker shade or the black is the 2D, in the lighter shade or the teal is our product. And this is passage two, or in our product, it's passage two equivalency. At six days, it's about the same senescence in cells. But as we go out to P10, which is approximately 30 days in this experiment, our senescence has not changed in the cells. But you can imagine as, as pretty typical, that changes in a 2D environment. Now we are actually in the process of comparing 2D, a spheroid, matrigel, and our bio blocks for senescence over time. Pretty typical, spheroids create necrotic cores, cells give up, they die, or they become senescence, uh, senescent in that process in 30 days. Major gel, taking major gel out 30 days, pretty difficult. We're seeing this repeat data, we're not ready to publish it yet, um, but it's proving we have a pretty good vehicle to limit senescence for cell growth over time. Another thing that's become really a hotbed over the last few years are the biologics that cells are creating. Uh, you, can, you can go find exosomes on the market for research. Uh, you might even be able to go to your local uh, beauty place and find uh, creams with exosomes in them. I, I don't advise that. I think it's kind of silly, but the my exosomes obviously provide value in my own body. So what we wanted to do is measure the exosome production or EV production in our cells. And what we saw compared to 2D is we get significantly higher quality, higher production of exosomes. We're also in the process of testing this out. We hope to roll out a product that is strictly designed that you can produce as many exosomes in your lab as you want. You have your own factory. If you want us to produce them for you, great but we want to put that back into the individual lab's hands. We think we have that model coming forward. We just need to find the places to test it outside of ourselves, but the data is looking very, very good. We looked at um, the other thing we wanted to look at, typical in labs, is a scratch assay. Um, how, what is the metabolic activity of our cells in a wound? We're currently engaged in a really big study on wound healing um, and how that can we do wound healing in the block? All the data is saying yes, we can. So again, we look here on the left, we're looking at a scratch assay in 2D at passage two. We go out to 22 hours, pretty typical. We go out 10 passages or 30 days. The cells are not migrating back together in that scratch assay. But when we look to the right, and again, we don't have subcultures, so we're doing a scratch assay at roughly equivalent time, six days. Looks pretty, pretty similar. When we go out to 30 days, our migration or metabolic activity in these cells looks almost the same as it does at six days, and it looks very, very different than what we see in 2D. And this is what we have seen, regardless of what we're doing with these, uh, with whatever cell line, 
cells are free to do what they want to do. And as long as we keep expanding the number of blocks, adding and subtracting those blocks as we need to, cells remain in a much happier state. So then what do the cells look like? I mentioned that one of our co-founders is a microscopist, so this was very important that we can image and show people. This top left picture on iPSCs is wonderful. We've now had three separate labs grow iPSCs. The first, and this is this is similar image that we've seen in all three labs. Um, iPSCs within a week form such large structures that they start to come out of the block. Now, the first two uh, labs that, that worked on this, they weren't very interested in, they just wanted a monolayer of iPSCs. They can't do it very easily. They can't scale in 2D. So could we just do a monolayer? The third lab said, well, yeah, these are really large aggregates. What's the quality of these aggregates? This particular lab has now been growing iPSCs in the same block and collecting the aggregates over the last two months. They ran PC, a qPCR on these using two of the four uh, Yamanaka factors, and our genetic expression of iPSCs after two weeks was significantly higher than their, um, uh, uh, their example in 2D. We think we have a factory for making iPSCs. We just need to find the next lab to do the next thing. We're very excited about working with this researcher. So then what about more um, production size cells? What you see in the middle, HEC-293 is one of your top five uh, production cells used in the world. This is taken strictly on an inverted scope. And what you see, all those aggregates forming on the block. This kind of spiral looking uh, thing in the middle, I'm gonna go back here for a second, remove these. These are the pores and channels in the block. And then you see all the dots. Those are the HEC-293 aggregates that are forming. Cells will form on the top. And if you see it on the top, they're winding their way down these channels and exchanging the same information on the top of the block as they are doing in the, in the middle. And I'm gonna show that in a second. This third image is super important because um, we had a client that said, we're working with chicken embryo fibroblasts and we can only grow them for four days because they start to differentiate at four days. We don't wanna do that. Well, you can imagine a chicken embryo that comes straight out of the egg is in a very, very dirty uh, product, we, we, and bacteria, by the way, grows very well in our block, so we want to eliminate that as much as possible. So we clean this up. We actually kept these fibroblasts from differentiating for eight days just to prove that we could. Um, and uh, we think we have a model for producing what this company needed without having to use so many eggs and so many chickens to get where they need to go. So that's still an investigation. So what about for the average lab? This was really interesting, uh, and I will tell you it is a salesperson's nightmare. When we are not a magic flask, cell count is not a, it's what everybody uses, but it is not a good barometer for how this product works. Because the cells are forming such complex structures, how do we do this count when they produce such large aggregates? We're able to take the block, use an enzymatic reagent that we created to break it apart to retrieve cells. But in the process of doing that, keep in mind that enzymatic reagent is only breaking the bonds of the block. It is not breaking the aggregate bonds. So what you see when you break apart the block, and these are primary porcine uh, cells, is you see really large aggregates coming out. But because they're wrapping themselves around material of the block and everything's opaque, sometimes it's a little bit hard to tell the difference between the aggregate and the block. So this year, we, or I mean last year, we pulled back a little bit and said, okay, we gotta figure this out. So instead of doing things by cell count, which is typical in a 2D environment, 
we start talking about aggregates and look for the aggregates, look for the structures, look for the complexity of what's happening, the new biology that you're able to witness. That has been a game changer for us as a company. We've had to come up with some new terminology that doesn't exist right now, and we're trying to champion that. You can see the whole block is, if you remember, is a one centimeter cube. This particular aggregate on the right is three millimeters in length with arms or legs coming off of it that are half to a full millimeter. The whole block is only one centimeter. And that's not the only aggregate. It's a rather large aggregate that was grown. So let's look at one of the images that Nikon sent right from the beginning. You're looking at the top of the block down one channel. That black space is the block. This has been stained with hoaxed, actin, and Milo tracker. And now we remove it. We were able now to see complex structures forming. This is the top of the block. And we're going to flip on the side to see 130 microns of one channel. When we fix and section the blocks, when we look at any cell line that's been in the block, this is typically what we see, and this is what's gotten Nikon so excited. We're able to see biology that we're not able to see in other formats. Um, there is a lot that we're seeing I would love to share. Uh, we're just, we have to figure it out first. So let's look at another one. These are mesenchym primary mesenchymal stem cells that we grew for 27 days. Again, pretty much the same thing. This middle place, that's one channel. Um, we're able to see cell migration, cell development, um, really beautiful uh, images. Um, very, very healthy cells in this process. And now we're going into the pore. Again, about 100 microns, 150 microns, and now we come back out and we see that cell organization. I did mention that we're able to section the blocks. When we section them this, we see this throughout the blocks. Um, if you're an engineer that wants to build a microscope that can see further into their blocks, let's talk. I think it's, uh, uh, if we could create a, a fiber optic that winds through one of those channels, that would just be wicked cool. We would get to see things that nobody's seeing right now in cell development. Um, and I, I would love to champion that conversation. So for uh, some of the folks, uh, one of the folks at the beginning of this was working in the lab. I'm going to make your life really super easy with how practical is this? Here we have Dr. Idine uh, uh, Medina Lopez working on cell culture. I'm going to kind of skip around in this. This is 24 T75s that we are loading media in and we're adding cells. Pretty typical, everybody's used to doing this. We take these 24 cells, takes you five to 10 minutes to seed and add media, okay? Now, pretty typical. And how about we replace 24 flasks with one six well plate? You're loading one plate instead of 24 flasks. That's gonna make life easier on you. But what does this mean for the CO2 incubator? One, 20, one incubator with 24 flasks or one incubator with one six well plate. Imagine how much space you could save, how much media you could save by switching. Now, let's get crazy. Can we automate our system? And the answer is yes. Imagine instead of having to come in at weird hours, the lab of the future could be you're sitting at home with an iPad and programming the change of media and cells. Our whole process is just pipetting. We went to a company called Integra. They're a company out of Switzerland and New Hampshire, and they have a very affordable liquid handler. You can do this with a regular pipetter, by the way, but their unit costs $25,000 starting. If it takes you five to 10 minutes to load one T75, we can load 72 of our blocks in that same amount of time. Now remember, if our block is equivalent to one T75, you just loaded 72 T75s 
in 10 minutes. And with very little effort, you pushed a button. No more, no more carpal tunnel. If our block is producing significantly better results, you've just changed the process infinitely. We are not inventing these robots. All of this is currently available on the market. We're just putting it together to make it easier on the technicians to scale, the clinical technicians to scale, et cetera. So what parallel studies can you do in the block? Well, this is again where you become, if you're more engineer and you wanna build the tools that go around us, that's one thing. But again, we're the peanut butter, you're the chocolate, let's make a Reese's peanut butter cup together. How does that work? This is an example of some of the different assays that can be done, but virtually it is every assay. There's thousands of cell lines, thousands of applications. How do we get there? On the, on the left side, you'll see, well, we could do an infiltration assay. We start with one compound in blue or one cell in blue, one compound in green or two cell lines, whatever. How do we migrate these together and see how they engage? I mentioned the lab doing neuroblastoma and Schwann cells. They just pipetted two cell lines straight into the same block to see what would happen. And those cells organized. If we want to look at a migration assay, this is just one example of what we could do. We look at common experiences, uh, experiments, instead of working with lots of different flasks, we work with one block and we can get that kind of quantity out of it. So there's a lot of things that we can do and we are willing to support that. We are going to discount our blocks significantly to academic labs as long as the goal is leading towards funding or publication, because everything that you will do with this block is infinitely more important than what I will do with this block or what I will say about this block. Putting it in your hands is critical to the ultimate success. So the parallel experiments, one block for multiple assays, multiple stimuli, multiple cell types, we can co-culture. We now can start looking at much more complex structures than 2D or even organoids and spheroids and multiple applications that will have to be built on over time. This next slide is going to show you what our traction has been for four years. And I will tell you that it's only about 50% of what we've done because it is really starting to blow up last year. This is going to show about 36 different cell lines. We are well over 60 right now. Um, somebody mentioned a cell line. I'm, I'm not sure if that's that same one, number 20 up there, UB-OC2. Uh, somebody mentioned something that sounded familiar, but we're working with a wide variety. It immortalized cell lines, this looks like a game changer. For primary cell lines, we've had multiple labs take those out over a month for growth. Uh, and they all terminated because they're like, hey, we got this a month, that's great. We're getting what we want out of it. I think we can go longer with primary cells. They seem to be thriving versus just staying alive. With that, we have our publications. Um, we're very excited about these publications. We think they're stepping stones for everything else. If you are looking at launching your own company, this next slide is going to be really important for you. And I'm uh, be glad to uh, tell you what little I know. When you start talking to venture capitalists and funding, they will tell you do one thing. Whoops, that went too fast. OK, they tell you do one thing and do it really well. Work on one cell line, work on one application, do it really well. Well, that would be great, except that our customers are coming to us from a very, very wide variety. And you look here, cell culture is a wide, wide variety. What are we doing? Um, I love this one at the top, the primary pediatric neuroblastomas in Schwann cells. I love the Nikon environment, the heart. You can look her up. It's Dr. Doris Taylor at the Tex was at the Texas Heart Institute and she launched her own company. She's been able to grow uh, eight rabbit hearts, decellularize and print the cells back on and get those to pump for four months outside the body, essentially making a heart. Her challenge is it's way too expensive to grow those cells up. She has identified us as a game changer because we bring her cost down 80 to 90 percent, which makes it feasible for her to look for funding 
to possibly make a heart. Uh, I like the one out on the, the, the right is we are currently in uh, uh, working towards an application to get our blocks onto the International Space, Space Station. That would just be cool. Um, if, if you're like a lot of people, we are uh, in our company, we have a lot of science fiction and just science people that love space. Uh, this is just, it's fun. The wound healing one is really unique. We are, uh, this project is going to be multiple years. We're working with a uh, doctor who has over 200 patents. Um, and our goal is, can we see what happens in a cut in primary tissue in minutes to hours and study wound healing in minutes to hours versus the traditional hours to days. So we think there's a lot to be developed in this. Um, I'm going to throw this one out there because this project stopped monoclonal antibodies. We have a lab that grew monoclonal antibodies and then they stopped the project. Uh, that grad student said, hey, I got other things I have to do. Um, but right there, what if we could get antibodies without having to euthanize so many rabbits and and mice and everything else what if we could get monoclonal antibodies from patient tissue i think there's applications there we just have to go through it and do it um, i have tons of more slides uh, if you have questions about the data but i think it's really important that um, we focus on what you want to accomplish and i throw this out there it's Sometimes it's hard to see the forest through the trees. In 1951, the first human cells were cultured, the HeLa cells, and we were all of a sudden we could grow these cells essentially forever, right? Um, when I read the book about Henrietta Lacks, and all of us should have a plaque of her somewhere in our, our, our walls and offices, uh, but think about 1951. There were no hood companies. There were no incubator companies. There were no media companies. ATCC did not exist. Um, you know, all that had to be developed. Everything when you go in your cell culture room had to be developed by some bioengineer to create these things. The first person to do the first assay on HeLa cells, you know, that had to be done. And, and, and if we follow that trajectory, 1951, we're culturing the cells. It's not till 1970 that HPV is discovered. It's not till 1983, 30 plus years later, that we discovered that the HeLa cells uh, were created by HPV and she ultimately died of cervical cancer from HPV. And ultimately then what it was about 2006, we end up with a vaccine for HPV. These are long, long journeys. It's not a one step journey for anybody. Uh, we think we're in that same journey. We got a long way to go. We're willing to support as much as possible. You tell me what you need. And as I told you in the beginning, find me on LinkedIn, grab my email, let's talk. Our goal, it's not what we do. It's what you're going to do with what we do that is critically important. Uh, and we think we have something that can help you do what you want to do. So Nick, hey, uh, University of Louisville, this has been great. I'm on uh, for all the questions you have. So I'm going to stop sharing. So um, hit me with them. All questions are good. I just want to drop a quick question. You had mentioned the heart growth with Dr. Taylor. So fun aside moment is I worked in her lab oh. while she was at Texas Heart Institute making those billions of cells. And I can contest that it took 12 hours to get all of the cells ready for one heart. Has she oh, mentioned like how long it actually has saved on making the heart cells that she needs? So she, so we have identified it. We've talked about it. Um, she is still working on funding for her company, but but talk about a small world. She is wonderful, Nick. Um, I know. I, as soon as you said the name, I just kind of laughed. Yeah, it's it's a small world. Um, we think time wise, we we can't change biology. We can't speed up how the cells proliferate. What we are doing though is we're creating an environment 
for them to proliferate better. You know, they're better cells. We bring her cost down when you're talking about media consumption, you know, the consumables, the environment you have to house these cells in, mm -hmm. get a lot smaller. And that's where the real savings is. And that's what makes it affordable to um, uh, scaling these things. I, can only I will tell days. you, there's some preliminary data that she's looking for. Uh, hit me up afterwards, reconnect with her, tell her you know me. I think there's a, a three-legged table to have. So it looks like uh, one of our graduate students has a question for Wes. Wes. Go ahead, Wes. Uh, about myself, uh, master's in engineering. Wes, I can barely hear you. I'm sorry. Is this any better? No. You might be able to try typing it in the chat if the audio doesn't work. I saw somebody popped up. How do you remove the cells? So you can fix and section the block just like you can tissue. Uh, we can either we have a block that can be uh, put into paraffin. We have another one that can cryostat uh, and then just section. But we've also created a particular uh, blend of block and a reagent we call extract. This is a reagent that you add to the block and it breaks the uh, bonds in the block. It does not break the aggregate bonds. OK, so your aggregates stay fairly intact and you're able to pipette them up. Um, and so you're, uh, you know, that would be a way, uh, so then you can extract your, you know, your protein to do a Western, you can extract your RNA to create cDNA to do qPC, whatever you need, you can extract that uh, from those cells just like you would any other way. Hello? Yes, Wesley, I can hear you really well now. Okay, uh, there was an issue with my dual monitor set up, sorry. Um, so a little about myself. Um, I'm a master's of engineering student here at UofL. And I formerly, during my undergraduate, I worked at Redwire, specifically the branch uh, was known as TechShot in Greenville, Indiana, where they developed the biofabrication facility, the BFF, which was the first bioprinter in space. And uh, are you at the liberty to discuss uh, where Ronak is at in terms of their interest in expanding or doing some research on the ISS? We are working with a few labs on this project. Um, we are submitting our grant, uh, just like submitting other every other grant. Uh, you know, we'll see. You know, and, and that's about where we're at. The preliminary data looks very good. We can. So with our block, we can redesign the macro structure. We are not going to re uh, redesign the microstructure. So where you see it as a puzzle piece, it could be a disc, it could be a ball, it could be a triangle. And that's some of the process we're working through of just submitting that grant right now. But by the way, your friends in Indiana, if they want to talk, let's collaborate. Uh, so I guess question would be, are you looking to uh, fabricate the bio block? Uh, in on the ISS, or are you looking to develop a method of getting it to withstand the sh rough shipping process up to the ISS? Um, actually, we're looking at cell prolifer tissue proliferation on the ISS. Uh, shipping it is very easy. We ship at room temperature throughout the world. Um, all we need to do is put it in some kind of a small container that it doesn't get crushed. Um, I'm going to hold it up if you guys can see me on this camera. That's all it is. All right, so very small little product that does a lot. Um, the we can print in space too. That will be interesting in zero gravity how that works. Uh, but but it doesn't. We just got to get it up there in the first place. So it's more about cell growth and then we worry about everything as we go. Okay, thank you. It looks like we have our other PhD student, Jonathan, with a question. Yeah, hi. Um, so I, uh, in the past, uh, with mesenchymal stem cells, um, 
and uh, you know, there's been many, many a time where we worked all day until two in the morning, harvesting. Um, so <laughs> I resonate with the uh, the issues the traditional methods have. Um, I guess uh, in in our case, we were wanting to end up with an injectable prod product. Um, do you see? Uh, and have you done any any work on you know once once you harvest from from your system you have a uh, structure I guess a you way know, to turn that into a, an injectable product where you have individual cells rather than rather than structures? Yeah, um, so there's a couple different ways um, we've been in talks uh, with this. The blocks over seventy percent water. So could you grow cells and then just put this onto a mouse? Or uh, in one case, could we grow the um, bovine cells for all that they would need for uh, antibiotics for the rest of their lives? That was a conversation that never went anywhere. Uh, the answer is, yeah, there's nothing in our blocks to interfere with the host. The other thing is what you said is, could we grow up all of our aggregates and then break them down into single cells for an injectable? Absolutely. You know, all you're going to do is a tissue dilution and now you have single cells. Um, that's possible. Uh, we, we recommend that. Um, so I've mentioned cell counts terrible because you're getting aggregates and, and sometimes some really uh, a lot of ECM in those aggregates. So um, we think measuring the and, and it's proving to be true when we measure phenotype or genetic expression or protein production, we can tell there's so much more there. So it just depends on what you want to do, but the answer could be yes. Looks like we got Landon who put a couple more questions in the chat. So Landon, uh, I'm reading your questions. Is the formula for the block a fixed design or is there opportunity to add other components aspects for the block? I'm going to answer that first part and the answer is yes. We can print anything we want into this block. Our printing capabilities are really rather advanced. Um, our ability to add something, the blocks over 70% water, the, we could probably get that down to 68% or something like that and be just fine. ECM that grows out of these cells is really quite unique. We've actually seen where the cells start forming ECM outside of our block, around our block, to bridge two blocks together and tighten them together. So ECM production uh, or manufacturing ECM into the block, yes. Um, uh, I think that's a conversation we should have because it's a, it's a great question. And I think once you see some of our videos, you'll be amazed at the ECM that's created in these blocks. The growth of a single block is said to be equivalent to a T75. Um, that's, a, that's the wrong way to think about this. Also, what's the cost compared to a, uh, to a T75? This is where we get stuck, okay? If we compare the cost of a T70, and I've sold a lot of T75s in my life. If we compare that cost, you're gonna think we're insane. If we compare the output of these blocks, you're gonna think that T block or T flasks are insane. And the reason is the quality of cell, the quality and quantity of biologics dwarfs a T75. But we have to do these measurements for relative understanding. When you grow uh, cells in a T75, you're going to get roughly three to five million cells. We grew, and then you have to passage. You have to constantly add trips into the cells. We wanted to max out a block. We got 360 million cells out of a block after 60 days. Uh, we, the total media to grow 360 million cells, and we think this is too much media, 360 million cells, we use less than 250 mils of media. So our production cost comes down significantly and that's all in that tiny little thing. So um, we're going to discount these blocks significantly for academia, but it's 
the equation doesn't really work for what you're getting out of it. And, and I would tell you too, let's investigate that together because the proof is in the pudding. Once you see it, you're like, oh yeah, this is this is radically different. But great questions and they're questions everybody has. All right, Jonathan, your hands up again and it looks like other hands, go ahead. Any other questions? I guess just piggybacking off of Landon's question, the fixed design you had mentioned. So does that open up a world where you can like possibly better mimic the structure of a cancer tumor and being able to use these blocks to understand like, um, I was gonna say more like results of maybe potential cancer treatment you're looking at? The short answer is yes. The complicated answer is, I don't know, I, I'm just trying to make the streamline of how easy is it to get that mimicked tumor structure. So you get to a, a printable state, I guess is my question. Without having you here and an employee that signs an NDA and non-confidential, it's a complicated question. But I can say it this way, is that the cells create the environment they want. The block doesn't force the environment. The, the We've seen cells start to reorganize the channels, the material of the block, because they're forming um, structures. They're able to signal uh, easily through otter block. They're able to exchange information, whether it be chemically, mechanically. They have the freedom. Of, I mean, think of it like a jungle gym. You know, all of us get on a jungle gym. Some of us are going to swing. Some of us, all of a sudden, it's a pirate ship. Some of us never leave a little corner of this because we've decided it's a fantasy world and we're in a spaceship, right? We all treat that differently. That's exactly what um, the cells are doing. So they're they're doing what they want to do. Looks like Landon dropped another question for another PhD student in our chat. I'm I'm unaware of that. Um, and McKinsey, that's a great question. Um, we're able to use a wide variety of materials in this and stiffness is not really the right word, but it's the word I use too. Um, the engineers in our company correct me on that all the time. We're able to go, uh, the current block, most of what people want are block that kind of resembles fat, but we can go much more stiff to something that will resemble bone. Um, and it really depends on what that actual cell is wanting. So we have a, a very, in fact, there is, I'm gonna share this slide because this answers that question. Uh, let me get over here. So this is, I think what you're asking, get there. So this is kind of the range of where most of our product is, but we can go softer into more brain more into a bone so it really will depend i don't know that there's been a phenotype problem with that um but obviously we want to accommodate the cells to the best of our ability so and by the way you'll um you'll note that we're taking some information from dupont but building out what our um for lack of better term stiffness of the product is Wes, I saw your hand come up again to number three. Did you have another question? Uh, I believe he answered my question. I was just going to ask about um, like the gel composition in terms of uh, uh, mechanical properties, stiffness, and then options like adding different growth factors, but I think that's been answered well enough. The answer is yes, yes, yes. We can do that. It just uh, sounds very adaptable. It, 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 it's a jungle gym for cells. So uh, Jonathan looks like he has his hand up too. Um, actually, I do have another question relating to, um, I guess, more of the origins of the product. The mm -hmm. bioprinter that you initially, or 
researchers initially modified. What model of bioprinter was that back in 2019? Um, I We've gone through several generations. What we're currently doing, I can't share, um, but um, if you go on our website, you'll sell, you'll see Cell Ink printers. We don't use them anymore. Um, you'll also see some other printers, and I, I, I apologize, I don't know the name of them. We do two different kinds of printing in our lab. So the BioBlock is printed on a very specific printer that that we control everything about. It's our intellectual part of our intellectual property. We also make tools that I would call gross printing. It's kind of like making toys. Um, that and so we make um, things like pancake flippers and, and spatulas and tongs and things to handle the block. So that's done on more. And, and you can find those in old videos on YouTube and so. But we've advanced well beyond those things too. Thank you. Any more questions anyone might have for Scott? Uh, actually, I do. Sorry, I, I keep coming up oh. with new questions. Um, the porous structure to the gel blocks themselves, is that um, is it vertical or also hor uh, sorry? In which axes does the, do those pores extend to? X, Y, and Z axis. OK, that's what I was thinking. We can. So here's a fun one, Wesley. And by the way, don't ever apologize for a question. Uh, I love them. I love them all. I will answer as many as we uh, we. Have, I have the next several hours free, so just let everybody know. Um, we can go horizontally. We can also go vertically with the blocks. The challenge is there's not an apparatus available on the mass market to go vertically. Hint, hint to you engineers. Yeah, we can design it. Somebody's got to test it. Somebody's got to try it. Somebody's got to come the application. So uh, there's there's a lot out there to be had. Um, so. And I would I would reiterate based on Wesley's point, you know, I'm sorry I'm asking another question. Don't be sorry, but reach out to me on LinkedIn. Let's start a conversation. I will do the same thing one on one with you, with your lab, whatever. We have no idea where the future is going to take us. I wish I did, but I don't. Well, thank you very much again. I have a, another meeting, but I will be sure to reach out to you. I, I definitely have more questions. <laughs> Awesome, awesome, looking forward to it. Anybody else? Yeah, I guess uh, this is Tommy Rousseau. I'm one of the faculty members. I guess I'll uh, just drop in real quick, say, Scott, it was a great presentation, man. I, I just, yeah. just fab fabulous stuff. Um, there's a company in town called uh, Advanced Solutions that makes a bioprinter. Um, now, you, you were mentioning the automation parts. Part of their deal is is uh, is uh, automating in any type of that you know pipetting and dispensing and stuff like that. And you, I think you need to you need to reach out to Mike Galway over there. Uh, I would love for them to get some of your uh, some of that hydrogel material and see if if they couldn't do that third dimension thing that you're kind of looking for. Because that's what I see it making it a scaffold for growing anything you want, you know, and then if you could sacrifice your scaffold and then suddenly you've got this, this, uh, the structure, you know, I think that's the, the science fiction of it is coming true is eventually we'll be able to print organs and stuff, but a uh, great presentation. I mean, I, I thought it was just fabulous. It's great to see where the technology is going, you know. Hey, Dr. Russell, um, if, I'm going to reach out to you. Um, if you do that in, uh, introduction for me, so it doesn't come from left field, because I've been in sales a long time, it's far easier yeah. for this form. The other thing I would say is, I'd be glad to introduce you to to uh, Dr. Taylor. If there's a way we could create that, you know, and and Nick already I knows think, her. Um, well, I think I think Dr. Taylor has been working with uh, Advanced Solutions uh, uh, to some extent. Yeah. Thank so, you for closing um, that gap. I wasn't sure if that was the one that is on the Army website or not, but it sounds right. Yeah, yeah I think I think so. Well, they're they're based here in Louisville. Oh, and, uh, their their CEO Michael Galway is on our board of external board of advisors. The Speed School 
uh, our college uh, board of advisors. So, um, you know, I think these are the kind of relationships that are, are going to make the magic happen. So I'm happy to facilitate that. But I, I uh, we're actually uh, waiting with bated breath because we're going to be getting one of their bio bots in one of our teaching labs. So we're going to be able to do some magic stuff with it. So we're, we're pretty excited. But And you nailed it. it. It's how I started this presentation. It's never one thing. It is. It, it's how we figure out how to put it together. And um, I would love that conversation. Thank you. You, you. This this presentation and talking to uh, all these great minds made my day. You just put the cherry on top, uh, offering to do that. So thank you. Well, well, well then, Nick, you got to close the meeting because you know. <laughs> <laughs> we, just go higher. Anybody want to go higher? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got I got to jump onto that same meeting that Wesley had to go to. So I appreciate the uh, opportunity to have you come speak and uh, great job and looking forward to uh, talking more. All right, thank you, sir. All right, guys, reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, uh, I'm easy to find. My, I, I'm going to give you my email real quick. It's S L E I G H, so Slay, as in like Slay Bell, at Ronak.com. Um, Ronak is R O N A W K dot com. And so, hit me up. Let's keep this thing going. And if you didn't catch the contact or you think of questions later on and you can't remember, I do have access to contacting Scott. You can also reach out to me. I can make the connection. Um, <clears throat> yeah, thanks everyone for coming today. Thank you, Scott. I think it was a wonderful presentation. You learned a lot. Uh, with that, if there's no other further questions, uh, everyone can have a good rest of your day and a good weekend. And go Chiefs, right? Anybody go Chiefs? Oh. All right, never mind. Sure. <laughs> Have a great weekend, guys. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye.